A plus friend of the program, Stephen Brooks of 24 7 Sports, joins us to talk all things signing day. Also, just a whole look at this 2023 football class, and then a little bit of basketball talk at the very end. Let's go. Our Locked On Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Spartan friends, Spartan family, welcome to Locked on Spartans, your team in green and white five days a week. And before we get this thing rolling here, make every moment more, visit, hey, FanDuel.com, America's number one sports book. Get started today. Get ready for Super Bowl 57. Head to FanDuel.com slash on today to get started. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll notice that Stephen Brooks is in Witness Protection Program. He has no face to show on YouTube, but if you're on the podcast, doesn't matter anyway, and honestly, who wants to see either of our faces anyway? Let's just, you know, tell the, the truth here. But regardless, here we are. It's Stephen Brooks. My man, welcome back to the show. How on earth have you been? Oh, great to be back. Yeah, no, thank you for the disclaimer on the video, too. I apologize. Sure. But uh, honestly, it's probably a gift, like you said, to, to the viewers and listeners and everything. So um, I've been all right. You know, basketball, I've uh, you've just been, you know, on that grind. Uh, the, the schedule, that first half of the Big Ten schedule was, I'm sure you've heard Izzo complain about it. And like by the end of it, I, I started to feel it too. Just the, the rapid fire succession of games, uh, quick turnarounds, quick trips, all that stuff. It's, it's been a lot. But um, a little football on the docket today was a nice little palate cleanser. We'll be in spring ball before we know it. Was the NCAA tournament, best time of the year. You know, my favorite thing in the, in the world to cover. So, yeah, thanks for looking up. Look at that. Yeah, you know, it's it's a hellacious schedule when even the media contingent are starting to get a little jet lagged here after a few yeah. weeks stretch. But Everyone's no one can blame you. Uh, media complaints. Yeah, I know. I know. But sure. Again, yeah, it was a lot there in a, in a short period of time. It was. Yeah, sometimes, you know, the, the complaints are a little silly, but I think those are legitimate complaints. I mean, uh, let, let's think about, you know, not just the players and the coaches. Let's think about you, the media. And, us fans, too, is also emotionally exhausting. But, hey, we're in the midst of a six-day break here between basketball games. So we're going to shine the light on football because you, you probably know it by now. Maybe some people don't just because of how quiet of a day it was. But Wednesday was signing day. That's right, the old traditional signing day. Now that's very overshadowed by early signing day. But Michigan State did get a commit and is from Philip Darius down in Florida. Steven, you're the expert amongst the two of us. What is it about this kid, and why did Michigan State go for a kid that only had group of five offers and bring him to a Power Five school like Michigan State? Yeah, this was a this was a Harlan Barnett production. Um, found him, liked him, you know, identified him, got him up here, and and uh, you know, pretty much had him in the bag uh, during his official uh, official visit. Um, gotcha. Early, you know, early late January there, and so just said, you know, wanted to keep it quiet, make a sort of a, you know, make it a big deal for, for today because, like you said, nothing else was really going on. Um, so I think his length, you know, I think they see upside in him, obviously. You know, that you talked about it doesn't have a ton of offers. Um, so, you know, you can take that for what it is. Doesn't, you know, this program, as much as anybody, can say that that doesn't always mean everything. Um, yeah. And Harlan Barnett, you know, is, is spe specifically, you know, is a guy who's, who's found some diamonds in the rough in the defensive backfield. So, uh, we'll see what it is. I, I just like the fact that they add another number, you know, another body to that position. Um, from what I understand, he's going to get a look at corner first, which I think okay. is is smart. He's got some good size there and see what he can do. You know, if, as safety as a fallback is, is always a decent uh, way to go, you know, just to see if he can you know, look. I mean, some corner is harder than safety. They're different deals or they require different skill sets, but you might as well throw him in the deep end, see if he can handle it at corner first. And then, you know, if need to transition to him. Uh, transition him to a safety spot so got some good length uh, or, i'm sorry a good size overall at six one about a buck 80 um and yeah i, I just think it's a, it's a good you know you've got some polished uh you know at the top of the at the top of the class with a um with him um i want to say mangum also for a second we we're just talking to his brother uh with rucker and uh, oh, yeah. you know some of the other guys that they've already signed so taking a flyer i thought you know if, if i know uh numbers too were running low mm -hmm. you know so I thought taking a flyer on, a, on another DB was a good move. Um, you know, Sean Brown was another late add in the first uh, first signing day. I think he's a similar similar guy in the sense of um, bigger bigger player. You know, a little more raw, more upside probably, more of a projection uh, with, with a guy like that. And so, same thing I think with uh, with Davis here. 
Just like you're saying, like, you know, the, the roster numbers are limited now. Like they only have a handful of spots left between high school additions, transfer additions. It's like four, maybe five. It's somewhere around that number, if I'm not mistaken. Do you, do you like Michigan State going for a kid that's a diamond in the rough sort of find maybe a two, three year project to maybe hope that he becomes a starter one day like Philip Darius? Or do you think that it would have been more wise to maybe use up one of those spots on a spring transfer in that window, where, where do you stand on this? It's I could be sold either way, right? Okay. I mean, because um, of course, you know, as everybody knows, you know, you hear it all the time. But like, there's there's a lot of truth to it that like the transfer portal isn't just like a supermarket, you know? Yeah. It's it's like right. a supermarket like uh, at like six p.m. on like a Michigan winter storm warning night <laughs> where everything's been picked through and rummaged and it looks like you know there was like a bomb went off in there. It, it's more yeah. like that. <laughs> um all the milk and eggs are gone you know it might be one oh. button left or this or that so it's so there's a little bit of risk in saying oh let's just hold this spot for a transfer not knowing who's going to be there what caliber of player um and so you know i was I, I, it was probably this show other places like i was saying around december signing day that like i, I was a little um i don't even know the right word but i i would have gone with a few more high school kids i okay. just think when you were looking at 15 of them uh, and that's including uh blackstock the juco guy but like 15, like you, you throw in the natural attrition that just happens that, you know, not that it's, it's a, it's not a black mark on Michigan state or anything, but just a natural attrition mm-hmm. happens. Guys don't pan out. Guys get homesick. Things occur in their lives. Like things happen. Not all these guys are going to stick through here for four or five years, you know? So I'm like, man, 15 high school kids and Juco is like, that's just a little light, you know, in terms yeah. of you could, you could end up in a pickle, you know, fairly quickly at a certain spot if a couple things were to happen. So in that respect, yeah, I do like the high school kid with the longer runway of eligibility here. You can mold him. You can work with him. I don't know what he'll ever be. I mean, look, there is, I do think there's a reason he wasn't a super highly recruited kid, but mm-hmm. uh, again, I also trust, you know, the, the track record of Harlan Barnett and those Mel Tucker, obviously defensive backs coach, everybody that they've got working on it over there that they saw enough to, to warrant bringing him in. So yeah, I'd much rather, I think, um, and look, there's, you know, there's, it's, it's more of a two way street now, you know, these days, if, if things don't work out, you know, they'll be able to find a replacement and, yeah. and uh, see what, you know, see what they can do there. So I, I do think uh, getting another high school guy, I, I agree with, unless of course, you know, there was a, a starting caliber guy, you know, with some power five experience, it doesn't even have to be power five, but you know, just a guy that could be a plug and play starter for you at corner. Sure. You know, go get him yeah. immediately, but that's, they were, they, they kicked the tires on a few guys, pursued a few guys, didn't land any of them, obviously. Um, so it's, it's, it's just more of a gamble. Um, so in this respect, yeah, I do like uh, sort of, you know, tying it up uh, with another high school guy. It's a great analogy, the supermarket at 6 p.m. on a winter storm, because that is especially is what the spring transfer window is to me. And that's why I like, you know, just taking a flyer on an under-recruited high school kid, because you're not finding starters in the spring transfer window. Usually these guys are transferring because, well, they see that they're two, sometimes three deep on the depth chart and want to find, a different home, you know, you're, you're not going to find that day one starter. Right. So yeah, let's just start burning these up on some high school kids. They did it with one. Um, and also too, I think Michigan state did a really good job in the earlier transfer window with building depth, which is what you're trying to do in the spring transfer portal. And actually they announced some of the kids officially today. Uh, they announced Jaron Mangum, of course, the running back, Jalen Franklin, the tight end, Aaron Alexander, the defensive lineman, and then Mason Arnold, the lawn snapper. I think all those guys are depth pieces, maybe too deep in the depth chart, but Steven, am I wrong on any of those guys? Or if they are, you know, just depth pieces, which one do you think has the highest impact of the four I named between Jaron Mangum, Jalen Franklin, uh, Aaron Alexander, and Mason Arnold? Yeah, so the, each of those guys are all kind of uh, different, I would say, in terms of what they're looking at here. I think okay. I think Jaron Mangum has uh, a legitimate shot to be at least involved. I mean, of course, if they were okay. going to play a game tomorrow, Jalen Berger would be your guy. He's still back, but... I think I, I liked Jaron Mangum coming out of high school. I uh, liked what I saw his first year at Colorado. I, I'll be honest, I kind of lost track of him down at South Florida, so I don't, yeah. I don't have as much a, of a feel for what he was doing down there. I know was, he had a decent uh, – scored a bunch of touchdowns one of the years. But, you know, I, I think he can be a factor there. He's a bigger-bodied dude, uh, you know, and just at that position, uh, you know, being sort of – sort of like, look, desperate, you know, I think is a word that comes to mind, like in terms of making a mark for yourself, putting yourself on that radar for the next level – um as a powerful guy i think he could be a third down uh, option for him as a pass blocker or just b- giving him sort of the elijah collins you know toughness between the tackles yeah and i still think that's something that, that jalen Berger can do better and those other guys could all have a hand in that type of role too but a short yardage goal line 
Um, third downs, I think at least he can carve out a, a bit role there. If not, you know, I wouldn't rule out him being more of a 50-50 carry guy um, or just, you know, just being much more than, than a specialized guy. I think he's got a shot. Um, but now it is a it is a deep room. You now Nathan Carter from yeah. UConn is going to have something to say about it. Uh, Davion Prim still hanging around. Jordan Simmons still hanging around for now. You know, so there, there's guys that are – it's not going to be easy. It's not like there's an immediate obvious opening. But with his experience, his skill set, his build, you know, he's, he's probably the biggest – uh, thickest back that they'll have in there this year. You know, Harold Joyner's got his own size, but you know, still sort of yeah. a slender dude with it with his height. But yeah, so I think he's got a shot. Franklin, I would expect to be in the mix. See, I don't, I don't see him as that, uh, as that starting level dude uh, right away. Um, so I, I think what you said immediately is is a is a is right with him. Um, and that that that's a position too where uh, they're, they, you talk about depth, they built a lot of depth. You know, I think uh, Tiny Hopper bringing him in, he's a guy where I see a more of an immediate pathway. Uh, okay. Because, you know, he, I think he'll be the best blocker in that room right away. Gotcha. So I know you didn't ask me about him, but I think uh, Franklin's a guy that could – we'll see where he can contribute, right? I mean, I don't know if he has any – like like a Hopper where he has that, that one skill set. It's like, oh, that's going to get him on the field. Or, you know, is he a better pass catcher than Malik Carr? Probably not. You know, mm-hmm. is he a better blocker than Hopper? Probably not. Can you blend those things and be your Tyler Hunt and give you a little bit of both? Maybe. But, again, you know, Jack Nichols is going to have something to say about that. Um, Michael Masson is coming off his injury. Maybe he can factor it. Yep. I still think he's a little bit away. But, yeah, so, so Franklin, I think, is probably more of depth. Uh, Alexander, definitely more depth. Uh, he, I believe, only has one year at the college level of experience, if I'm remembering right. There's, there's, there's a lot swimming through my head with all these guys. Right. But I think <laughs> yeah. he only has one year. So I want to say he's a little bit of a lighter dude anyway. I think he might need to put on some muscle and some, some weight. Um, so, but still depth helps your numbers. Um, you know, like a, like a tank Brown was in that first transfer class, like a lot of potential and some good things, but just a guy that you probably wouldn't expect to, to do a lot immediately. Sure. Um, and then uh, what was the other one? Mason, uh, uh, Mason Arnold, is that his name? Yes. Mason Arnold. Yep. Long snapper. Yeah, so yep. yeah, I think you're just looking ahead. Of, obviously Hank Pepper's here on scholarship and um, right. you know, if he can get back to form, then, then you're all good. But obviously last year showed that, uh, you know, there's value in having a capable second guy. So I think that's where he slots in. Uh, yeah, that goes without saying. <laughs> um, we're going to be back in a hot second talking more. I said, we're also going to get into Dyron Reynolds because he also talked to the fine media contingent of Michigan State here. But I got to talk people's ears off about FanDuel Sportsbook, Steve. And we'll see you in a hot second. Don't go anywhere, please. I beg you. We're really excited about our new sports betting partner for Lockdown because they are the number one sports book in America. We are talking FanDuel, ladies and gentlemen. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. Download FanDuel now so you can bet on Super Bowl 57 with a no-sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel also lets you bet on everything from the money line to point spreads. Who's going to score a touchdown? Find all the props and futures for Super Bowl 57 at FanDuel. And best of all, FanDuel Sportsbook is safe, it's secure, super easy to use, and you cannot beat how fast you get paid with FanDuel. You're getting your winnings instantly in your pocket. You are not waiting for days at a time for Mr. FanDuel to pay you. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. He's an honest man. He gives you the money right away. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to claim your no-sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. And let's get Stephen Brooks back into the mix here. Uh, You were just at a press conference with the one, the only, the newest addition to the staff, Dyron Reynolds. Of course, the defensive line coach comes here from Stanford. Point blank, first impressions of him, Steven. Is this guy going to guide us to the national championship? Uh, th- that easy of a question. <laughs> uh, I mean, I was pretty impressed by him. Seems like a nice guy. Uh, seems like a guy who can okay. um, can motivate and teach, you know, and those are some of the things that Mel Tucker talks about all the time. Uh, it was interesting. Um, a couple of things, I think, stood out. I mean, in terms of it was a – it's a media scrum. It's a brief deal. Like, I'm not going to yeah. act like I know the guy super well. But, I mean, he was, he was, he was a good time to talk to. I thought he was insightful. Um, seems to be a bright dude. But the things that stuck out were like um, he pushed for the job. First of all, you know, he, okay. he uh, Mel didn't really know him very well. And he, neither side, neither party really knew each other super well. Um, but he saw the opening and he he tapped into his, some of his connections and uh, you know tried to get an audience with Mel Tucker and uh, and actually I believe it was BT Jordan he said first um, when they were at the okay. coaching clinic uh, earlier in January and was sort of bending his ear, getting to know him, and then you know they uh, knew about the opening and. Uh, and then I think he also said use some other NFL connections to to get in touch with Mel, and then you know got an audience and, and won him over. So that was interesting it, that it wasn't somebody that 
uh, Mel either had recommended necessarily or uh, that he had a deep history with. Um, he talked about what he, you know, the sense of what he thought Tucker was looking for was something I was asking him about. And he said, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot about like, he talked a lot about like teaching and just being able to relate concepts and teaching in pieces that, that connect to the whole. Um, gotcha. And that's something that, that doesn't surprise me. You know, I thought that was pretty obvious. It went just with the makeup of their staff, but I thought that would be something that Mel would um, target in the process was a, was a good teacher, a true sort of X's and O's guy. Because when you got Brandon Jordan right there to sort of mold the raw material and be an, an on-field skills guy, like you want that compliment to be very strong, like on the blackboard, on the film room, um, game day adjustments, things like that. And I think that's a lot of what Dyron brings. I mean, 25 years, uh, you know, a, a ton of time in the NFL, so he knows that world. He sent guys to the NFL from the college ranks. Um, so I think that's all going to check out. I think he'll be an effective recruiter. And that's the, speaking of recruiting, and something I was really curious about and I asked him about was recruiting at Stanford, right? And, and what that right. does for you. Um, because as you know, folks might not know, but like Stanford is everybody, you know, when it comes, when you're talking trash to your rival, you might say, Oh, you couldn't get this kid into school or this or that, whatever. That's, <laughs> it's not always really the case, but it is at Stanford. It is yeah. the case at Stanford. <laughs> Notre Dame, I know, has some 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 weird things with like a language requirement. The service academies, those are the places where it really is different in terms of recruiting a kid and getting them into school. Stanford specifically, you can Google it. There's been a bunch of articles. I mean, uh, I believe that the number that sticks out is about like 10 percent. I don't know where I got this from one of these from one of these stories, you know, whether it was a Sports Illustrator or somewhere. But uh, during the height of their run with Harbaugh and, and Shaw and everything, it, I remember reading it was about like 10 percent of like all D1 material type of kids are academically fits and eligible to make it into Stanford. Wow. So your, your pool, and maybe <laughs> that's not right. Let's even say it's like a third though. You know, uh -huh. it's, it's somewhere around there. It's, 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 it's vastly smaller than, than what you're working with at a Michigan state. And what that means though, is that you have to go everywhere. You can't just, you're not just going to go in your little, you know, Northern California pocket, even the West coast, even just, you know, this or that you're going to go everywhere. He talked about throwing a couple of darts at kids at Michigan and the Midwest in general and talked about how hard it was to get them out there and to just but it but it forces you to have relationships coast to coast, I think, which is really, I think, a unique aspect. And uh, he talked about, you know, it's going to be different for him where uh, Michigan State, as we all know now, like their position coaches recruit their positions. And that's sort of a newer deal. I don't know how many staffs do that. You know, for the longest time, it was you had areas, you know, this guy recruited yeah. South Florida, this guy recruited Texas, this guy at Ohio, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's how they did under Mark D'Antonio for the most part. Tucker uh, has his guys almost exclusively recruiting their position. And he said that's going to be a change for him. But th I think that goes hand in hand with his background in the sense that, like, we all know the type of targets that, that this staff's targeting. They're not all neatly, you know, packed in the Midwest or this place or that place. They are all over. So I think him recruiting that position, having a coast to coast uh, experience as a recruiter, I think is going to be really interesting to see play out. Gotcha. And just going back to signing day, let, let's mix it up. Let's do some superlatives over here. Let's hand out some awards. And this is going to be for all encompassing signing day, the early period today, because if we just did today, then well, Phil Darius is going to win every single award. Uh, so let's just, you know, the whole 2023 class, we got a few of these jotted down, Mr. Brooks, if you are ready to uh, be the judge and award some of these Hit superlatives. Me, yeah. All right. Best tape. Best tape of any kid from the 2023 class. What just, you know, has you saying, wow, when you're throwing on his huddle film? Mm. That's got to be by Job. Um, yeah, that is. Okay. It, it might seem like the easy answer because he's the highest ranked kid, but the yeah. level that he played, he didn't play at the, I, I don't believe the biggest schools in Oklahoma. And uh, he was, you know, it was just the man amongst boys effect out there at times. I yep. mean, he's, he's in the backfield, like when, as the quarterbacks feeling the leather for the first time, <laughs> like the ball and him arrive at the same point. <laughs> Not only that, so he's got some explosive, like crazy Dwight Freeney type of moves and, and highlights like that, but also he's returning kickoffs for touchdowns. Yeah, right. Whatever he is, 6'4", 220, whatever. You know, he's he's uh, playing some running back, I believe. He took a carry, took a sweep in for a touchdown or something. So he's doing everything on that field. He's just – he's the best player on the field, the most athletic, and 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 truly looks like it. So, yeah, his his film is the most, uh, most fun to watch by far. Now, this could also just be by Job easily enough. I mean, the kid is an all-world athlete. But instant impact kid for this class, who do you think sees the field early and often in their freshman year, or if none of them, then early on in their sophomore year? 
any uh, any position here, like offense or defense at all? Yeah, any position. All? Yeah, or, or you can do one each. You know, you you're, you could you could really take this topic and just hijack it yourself if you feel <laughs> fit. <laughs> give me give me Andrew DePape, which you know might sound funny that I just talked about by Job sure. at the same position, but like. Bob Job is still a guy that's very raw, right? Like okay. he's, he's ranked that high. He's productive and, and he's got um, verified like athletic traits and measurables and everything. But as a football player, still pretty raw. I, and, and I quite, you know, I think he's got to pack on a good 20 pounds probably to even, even be a rotation guy this year. You know, I just, I could picture him being, you know, it's probably foolish, but like at his weight now, like he's just gonna get ragdolled out there no matter how quick he is, no matter how polished his moves are. So he's got to put on weight right now. Okay. I think DePape could come right in and, you know, he could suit up tomorrow for them, I think. And, you know, it might not be it might not be pretty, but I think he could at least hang in there. You know, mm-hmm. so now the fact that he's an early enrollee, getting all these reps, he's going to put on a good 10 to 15 pounds, I would say at least probably. Getting the spring ball reps, going to compete all throughout camp. Um, not that there's a, again, like we talked about with Franklin, not like there's a walk-in path for him to just be a set, you know, be a backup and then maybe try to work his way to a start, but – I think he's he's polished enough and he's he's big enough too. He comes in with a frame where I think he'll be able to play. Um, I look at his freshman year with like like Zion Young's last year. You know, we saw a little bit of him, then we saw more of him, then we saw more of him. Then you know, then he was a starter. You know, before before he got uh, in trouble there. So I think a, maybe not rising to the starter ranks with the pay because again, there's some injuries that factored into Zion Young doing that. But I yeah. think he will be in the two deep. I think he could be in the rotation by the end of the year. Um, and because as you look at it, I just don't see a lot of obvious day one playmaker guys. I mean, a lot of their highly ranked dudes are O-line, D-line. Right. Um, offensive line, you're just not expecting anybody to really make a factor, you know, to make a dent their first year. The receivers, maybe that's a position where you can see guys break through, but like they've, they've got a lot of experience ahead of them. Um, and then a young guy like Tyrell Henry, young guy like Antonio Gates, probably trying to trying yeah. to beat up those reps. So there, there aren't a lot of easy, easy obvious picks here, but uh, give me the pay. I think he's physically ready. He's got a lot of good skills that are, that are advanced for his age and pack on a little more weight. I think he'll be ready to, uh, you know, get his feet wet out there. Do you think Keyshawn Blackstock is, is a day one starter? And I get like, cause it, it's weird with him, right? Cause he's a junior college transfer, but he is considered part of this class. So like, is, is he a, a day one starter in your opinion? You think? He's at least a day one, two deep guy for sure. Okay. Yeah, I should have said him actually. I, he, I sort it's of, confusing I, though. I, yeah, I get no, it. I, yeah. I sort of um, blanked him out of my mind just because of the Juco aspect. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If he's not starting, he's in the rotation. He's going to, he'd be the Brian Green like, like last year where uh, okay. if they rotate, he would probably be the first guy off the bench. But um, yeah, I would, yeah, definitely. Whether it's a tackle or guard, you know, I mean, he's going to have to battle Spencer Brown for that right tackle spot. Um, mm-hmm. Well, maybe he could play left and, and battle Baldwin there. But, I mean, uh, I think Gino Vandermark has, has showed some pretty good things, too, at guard, where I, I'd be curious to see that battle, where I don't know if it's a giving, it's a it's a sure thing that Blackstock would win that. So, I, I'm curious, but he's absolutely in there too deep. Um, gotcha. Absolutely. And instead of instant impact, just best overall impact, like when their three- or four-year career is all said and done, like what guy do you see having the biggest impact for Michigan State? There's definitely no shortage of candidates when you have nine four-stars coming into your program, but is there one that sticks out above the rest? And is it just simply the top 100 guy? And by Job, I'll ask again. It's uh, I'm not going to go Job just because I think there's more of a gamble with him, right? Just because he is okay. further away from his ceiling, no doubt. Of this class, he's probably got the highest ceiling, yeah, because he's got mm-hmm. that wiry Alden Smith type of, um, you know, build and game to him. And like, whereas the pape, like, and, and like, don't don't take this the wrong way, but like, he's built and his game is more like a Bosa type uh, of gotcha. defensive end. So we're talking about two different types of guys. I'm not saying he'll be anywhere near that player or that productive, but that in terms of style. So I, I think the pape will be involved earlier, have a chance to you know, do all those things, set records or whatever, and, and, and be a long-term contributor for him. Um, man, I mean, I think Brennan Parachek could be a good player down the line. But give me, like, I, I, I don't even know if this is out of, out of left field, but give me Jordan Hall. Just because I think he's got some of those like intangibles. Um, yeah, he's the only linebacker like in the class. So, and they're, you know, they're going to lose some guys after this year where he could have a long runway, I think, here. Three-time captain of IMG. Everybody raves mm-hmm. about him being a, just a very rare leader and just a charismatic sort of individual for that, for that age group and everything. So give me him, you know, in terms of being a fan favorite, a guy people are crying on senior day and everything. Yeah. People, everybody already loves his mom, you know, yep. uh, you know, so t- you know, maybe a Darian Harris type where it comes up with some big plays, steady program, dude, all the way through. 
something like that. I mean, I know that maybe that's not biggest impact in terms of NFL or, you know, all conference, all league or anything like that. But like in terms of value and what he's bringing to the program over yeah. those three, four or five years, uh, I'll go with him. Yeah. And again, I don't think you can go wrong with like a pair of check or, or by Jove, I think would be a decent pick yeah. The tape. I think would be a good pick too. like Stanton Ramil, I think is going to could as a chance to be a very, very good player here um, at tackle. So th- there's a lot of good options. No, I, yeah, absolutely. I'm Darian Harris is always the comparison I make with Jordan Hall, and yeah, so like on the field, off the field. I mean, that's that that's my pick. I mean, uh, and of course, just like you said, there's a, a ton of other picks that you can make for that. And last one, really quick, but most impressive recruiting win for Mel Tucker. This could either be can't believe that he got the top 100 kid in by Job, or is there another guy that you know other schools were hot after to try to flip, and Michigan State held on to them, or what is the most impressive recruiting win for this staff in this cycle? Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good question. Uh, I would Thanks. go Blackstock is in the conversation okay. because he, he was highly, you know, highly prioritized by many people um, and they needed him. Right. Like they needed somebody with some experience, with with some versatility. Like they just they needed another body. Yeah. Um, I, I think I say it every time on here, but like the whole line is still an, is still an issue for this program. They're not going to move right. forward as a program yeah. <laughs> until they get that thing right. So he's right in there. But it's Stanton Romeo. Um Okay, to me, you know, just because tackle is a, and maybe Blackstock will end up as a tackle, but like Ramil is like an NFL prototype looking type of tackle. I think mm-hmm. Blackstock, if he has a great, nice career, he's still probably an NFL guard, you know, but Ramil is a tackle through and through. Uh, a lot of people wanted him and they did have to fight off, you know, some, some SEC powers down there. Um, he comes out of Alabama, which I learned today. He's actually from upstate New York, though, lived there oh. most of his life. So he's not a Southern dude through and through. But, okay. you know, those those closer schools down there in the SEC and everything were sniffing around hard. Tennessee and Auburn, I want to say for, uh, specifically, were, were two that were trying to get in the mix. And, like, that's – look, I get that. Like, you're a highly ranked kid. Like, the, look, at, look at the last 15 national champions. Look at the NFL draft. Like, the SEC yeah. pull, like, I would imagine has to be hard. You know, it's strong, I'm saying. It has to be hard to combat if you're Michigan State. So, and, and they did have to fight uh, pretty much down to the wire to keep him. And, and he is, I believe, the highest ranked – tackle that this program has signed um like in the digital rankings era so if it was, if he pans out and gives him a, a you know a quality starting left tackle for three to four years um then then that's a major major win so yeah i think that's got to be him because again that's that you just can't have enough of those he's a bona fide tackle the program for five six years now has been lacking that type of body and, and skill set so yeah. uh, to get a true textbook guy like that, that that everybody wanted and to hold off the competition they held off i think it has to be him Bang. Hey, there we go. That's that's football banter. That's signing day banter. But hey, before uh, I let you go and enjoy the rest of your day, I'm going to hold you hostage for one more quick question. We're going to jump sports, though, head to basketball. You were down at West Lafayette. You know, we just talked that this has been a grueling January for this team. They played for what? It was at 27 games in the month of January, it felt like. What was the body language amongst the players in the locker room after the game? Did this feel like a team that just needs a six-day break? Or what were the vibes after the 16-point loss at Mackey Arena? Yeah, so they were – look, I mean, the body language was defeated. So, But look, but as I say that, like, not, yeah. not big right. picture, but just as it relates to that team, that mm-hmm. environment, that guy, right? Like everybody yeah. was just ready to throw their hands up and say, look, what, what are we supposed to do with this 7-4 dude, right? Obviously, yeah. I'm talking about Zach Eady. Like that, there was a defeated in the sense of of that matchup, not in the sense of what they can be or what the season is or anything like that at all, at gotcha. all. I don't want people to misconstrue that. But yeah, I mean, there was, they were just you know shoulders and heads were hung and it was just like throwing your hands up, palms to the sky. Like what what are we supposed to do with that guy? I mean, we that's what multiple people said they threw everything they had at him, uh, they threw the book at him as AJ Hogard said. Like, and obviously he it, none of it worked, right? And yeah. Um, the environment was great. You know, I don't think they really got knocked off by the environment so much. Although it was great. It was white out. It was loud. Um, mm-hmm. It was just, you know, everything we love about college basketball. But it just, you, you know, it, at a certain point, it becomes a physics issue, right? It's not necessarily right. a strategy <laughs> or effort or skill issue. It just yeah. comes down to freaking physics. And like, I, I you know, they, that's kind of the mood. And when you ask body language, that's absolutely what it was relative to just that game. I don't want people to think that they're, 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 you know, they're throwing in the towel in the season or anything. Obviously, they still yeah. have a, a ton to play for. But as it relates to that matchup, they're, they're, let's just say they're, they'll be happy if they never have to face Sakidi again because they I, just they ran out of answers. I, I'd be thrilled as well. Uh, I'm actually putting together an NIL package for Edie to not come back to Purdue next year. Uh, I'm going to try the first reverse 
NIL package and see if that gets off the ground. We'll start a GoFundMe. We'll crowdsource a bunch of money from all the other conference schools and see where, see where it goes. Because I'm go. running out of ideas, too, of what to do with Zach Eady just from my couch. So that's uh, the best I could do. I don't know. Cool. Yeah. For me, I just want to see this team, like, uh, you know, as they're fully constructed, right? You know, I think that's what everybody wants to see. It's just, I mean, that'd be nice. Last, yeah. The second half of the Big Ten, obviously, they're, you know, take a miracle – or two or three to to somehow sneak back into Big Ten title contention. That's yeah. that's all, all intents and purposes. That's out the door. Uh, obviously, you're playing for NCAA seeding. That's always important. Uh, Big Ten tournament. You know, you can make some noise and, and do your thing there, and you know, win a banner that way. I just, it's it's frustrating talking about this team, watching this team, covering this team because like, there's it, you feel like you've been teased. I think in a lot of ways. I mean, you can speak to this, Matt, but it's like you you don't really. We haven't seen the real thing except for bits and pieces. That first two weeks, really. And yeah. then a game here, a game there. But it's just always something is off, um, whether it's an injury or a guy's having an awful night or somebody's sick or whatever. But it's like this team's played like maybe 10 games, fully constructed, fully healthy, all systems go. And like that part I'm sure is frustrating because when they have, there's been some really good stretches of basketball. But it's just we haven't seen this full team together at full strength uh, very often at all. Yeah, like it does feel like 10 games and even in those 10 games there are still you know some minute limitations with some guys coming back whether it's Hall or Akins but like yeah it really does seem like we haven't seen this team go full throttle since the first what 30 minutes against Villanova before you know it kind mm-hmm. of got squirrely there at the end but yeah like that is that's the team that I just oh just look at just w- wondering where and when yeah. we can get back to, to that. But I think you tip maybe, your it has, cap. maybe it doesn't. Yeah. I think you tip your cap with I, I think a lot of fans are tipping their cap with like how hard they're playing, how they've they've made up for some of these Correct. things and, and you yeah. know grinded through a lot of these uh injuries and now you know then and then they then they spout off about Izzo not adding the right pieces and this and that. And those are separate things. But I think the guys sure. have, have grinded through some tough stuff. And I just know if they can string like eight to ten healthy games together here through the yep. end of this month and into the tournament, like that, I just know that's a team that I wouldn't want to face in the, in the big dance. Like that's yeah. a Michigan state team that I do not want to see uh, if they could put a couple games together healthy here and get some, get some rhythm. Because as we've, as I said, we've, we've seen some pretty dang good stretches of basketball from them when they are at their best, but it's just about yeah. where you see them at that best. But that, that's a team that, I mean, it just looks like a team that could be a five, six, seven seed and ends up, I don't want to. I don't want to say that, but makes a run. You know, oh, I've, I've said it four start. times in the last week. So yeah, you you feel free if if you say it, no one's going to care because I've said it enough where some people are starting to get sick of me saying that they could make a run. That double F word, much. but they could make a run. They're they're going to be a dangerous <laughs> yeah. team if they can get the patch this all together, get a couple games of rhythm, and uh, yeah. and start looking like some of the best that we saw early in the season. Then again, they're just they're going to be a low seed, but they're not going to be a team that anybody that's a one, two, or three seed wants to face. I guarantee you patch it up, get healthy, start rolling, and then also get a little luck on Selection Sunday. Don't face a team that has a behemoth center on their team. Um, not not to add a third, you know, uh, media source here. You know, you got myself, we have you, 24-7 Sports. But Graham Couch wrote a great article, Lance State Journal, after the Purdue game, where he highlighted a few years where, yeah, it's late January, early February, and the season looks like it's becoming lost only for them to have a strong surge. So, no, it, it's not just us, you know, thinking that, you know, having some bias. But, like, that, that actually does happen under Tom Izzo. And, yes, it has been a while. These last three years have been tough. But I don't know. Like, people know how sour I could be. I really don't sound like that anymore. I sound very homerish with the, with the way I talk about this team and my thoughts on if they can make a March run. But I still see it. And, and it starts again this Saturday. If this Saturday goes completely south, they lose by, like, 30 at Madison Square Garden, then – Okay, I might pump the brakes a little bit, but until then, I I don't know. Just like you said, if they can get healthy, I, I still see an ingredient for a good run, a good run. I don't want to say the double F word either, but a good run. That's, that's yeah, all I mean. they've got that that core. I mean, when I say that core, Hogard, Hauser, yeah. um, Malik Hall, yeah. Walker, yeah, of Walker, course, yeah. That that core of veterans is can take you places. I mean, just not a lot of people have. Now, the one thing is you mentioned a dominant big man. That's gonna be trouble. Or a game where you just a game where you just need a guy that you know is going to give you twenty, you know, to match some other killer or something like that. That they don't have that one go to guy. Um, Obviously, there you know there are some of their parts, but that veteran core, man, they've all played. They're all pushing or at like a hundred games, you know, played in their career. It's just that that stuff wins in college basketball, and and you're not going to shut down all four of them. You know, someone's going to have a good game. They may not have the twenty five thirty point game. You know, if somebody has a real alpha out there, but 
someone's going to have a good game. If you just get a decent game out of the others, like there's just that, that veteran core is, is something pretty rare in college hoops today. And that's what wins at the highest level when you, when you boil it all down and get through the bracket there. So I like that part of them and that backcourt, as we all know, backcourt play will carry it too. It like I'm pulling every cliche, right? Like backcourt wins in March, veteran leadership wins in March. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've, I've pulled out all the stops in the last week and a half and, some people agree, and it's driving others crazy, but that's just, you know, the, the dialogue that you get in late January hoops. About and, and who team. scares you, right? Like, who, scare, who should really scare Michigan this State? Other than Purdue. This country is wide open. Like, it is wide open, unless, yeah. you know, you draw Purdue again. But, yeah, like, it is wide open. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I know we just jinxed Michigan State into losing in the first round in a 6-11 versus 11 game against College of Charleston. But I digress. I, you know, I, I know we just ruined the season by talking about this. But I, at this moment, I still think, yeah, the ingredients are there for a nice run. That's 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 what I think. It's, it's glad that you think that too. It's glad that I'm not just like the crazy go green homer over here, like someone that's down the middle and objective and rational, like yourself. Also, seize the vision, Stephen. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm there, man. I, I still think, yeah, it's going to be a weird year. You know, when you look it is at, weird. when you look at yeah. back on it in whole, just because of how disjointed it was. But man, if I can just yeah. put it together for a little bit, it doesn't have to be long. At the right time, obviously, yeah. you got to put it together. But I like that veteran core. Um, and uh, like I said, nobody really should scare them, I don't think. There we go. Start with some signing day, end with some shooting hoops talk. Steven Brooks, 24-7 Sports, you are the man. Anything else you want to say or plug before we kick you off the airways here and have you enjoy the rest of your Wednesday? Uh, no, thanks for having me back on. I guess, actually, if, if you listen to this still on Wednesday, uh, if you're an early adopter, yeah. Um, we are running a 60% off VIP sale right now at Spartan Tailgate. So go ahead and grab one of those. It'll, it'll end at midnight. Um, so if you're really, you know, if you're on top of it, listen to this, go ahead and grab that. But otherwise, uh, no, keep listening to Matt, keep reading our stuff, hopefully. And uh, I'll talk to you guys again soon. And until then, gang, we will be back tomorrow. We're going to talk about the MSU Rutgers game. We're going to talk about some other things. Also, next week, we're going to have a few mailbag shows. Locked on Spartans at gmail.com if you ever want to reach out with any question matter how serious or how ridiculous it is, send it on over. Until then, enjoy the rest of your day. Love you all. Go Green.